Last night, a few moments before I went to bed, the Lord moved me to start a brand new study series in a way I never, ever did before. What I believe we need to do as a church family, and that's to go over a sermon series that was boldly rejected by the Seventh-day Adventist Church back in 1888 that actually caused the latter rain and the loud cry to be paused until our day when the obedient remnant people are going to be standing in obedience to Christ. So as I went over it last night, I wondered. Um, I, I, I wondered if the Lord would actually have us study this up. Because after all, I didn't write this sermon. He did. <laughs> he, as a matter of fact, I don't write any if you think about it. But So the enemy of souls placed doubt in my mind as to whether or not this was actually our Father's will. You know, starting this study series. But the Lord moved me to look. Now, this was weird. <laughs> I guess I just don't do this. Especially with this old piece of junk phone that I have lying around. That uh, it's usually in the bathroom, but it's you know it's getting charged up right now, and it it it's on airplane mode permanently. It doesn't even have a SIM chip in it. But you know, I was moved to uh, look through the photos of this cell phone this morning, as I rarely do, you know. And the second picture in the phone was a screenshot from uh, Review and Herald, September 3rd, 1889. And this was just answer to my prayer because, you know, I'm concerned. Do you really want me to do this? I mean, because like, I've never done this before. And, um, but this is what it said this morning. It said, the thought that the righteousness of Christ is imputed in us or imputed to us, not because of any merit on our part, but as a free gift from God, seemed a precious thought. Think about that, especially you babes in Christ trying to figure out how to get closer to Christ. Yeah, it's no mistake you're here today, you know, in the, uh, our church service here, online, offline, wherever. It goes on to say that the enemy of man and God, that's Satan, is not willing that this truth should be clearly presented. For he knows that if the people receive it fully, his power will be broken. If he can control minds so that doubt and unbelief and darkness shall compose the experience of those who claim to be the children of God, he can overcome them with temptation. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I was just thinking about this the other day, too, in regards to certain people that were in my son's life before he died that tried to tempt him off the path, but they failed. He tried to get them on the path. But if you don't have your eyes on Christ, then you're going to fall off the path. Because your friends will lure you and say, hey, you know, come on, what are you, Jesus freak? You know, that kind of stuff, you know, or trying to make you feel like you don't want to share your faith because you'll get embarrassed. That's Satan's little trick. Anyway, it goes on. It says that simple faith that takes God at his word should be encouraged. That's why I like to talk about 1 John 1, 9. If you sinned, confess it. It's gone. Take him at his word. He's not a man that he should lie. And so when he said your sins are going to be gone when you confess him, yeah, they're gone. Take him at his word. Satan will sit there and say, oh, no, 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 you still got to keep confessing. But tell him to shut up. Say, get behind Satan and, and continue on because our God can't lie. And so when we repeat confessions and stuff like that, we're kind of leaning towards Satan's lie. Well, actually, we're definitely leaning towards Satan's lie, if you think about it. Because God said it's gone. Satan said it ain't. So who are you going to believe? It's up to you. And that's where everything hangs, in fact. She goes on to say that God's people must have that faith, which will lay hold of divine power. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Now, imagine getting pulled over by a cop, and then he gives you a warning ticket. He gave you grace. You still broke the law, but he let you slide. He says, okay, here's your, you know, I'm not going to give you the ticket. I'm just going to give you a warning. So do you punch it when you're leaving and spray gravel all over him and his car? No, because you're denying his grace. 
The same thing with our God. You commit a sin, you confess it, it's gone. He may give you a little bit of a warning, <laughs> you know, like a little spanking here or there, but hey, at least you're still going to make it home without speeding. <laughs> so she goes on, she says, not all will receive the light, forsake their sins, and believe the words of eternal life, and without drawing back, go on from one truth to another until guided into all truth. In other words, not, not a lot of people are going to study the Bible and say, oh, wow, learn something new every day, can't wait till tomorrow, kind of a Christian, right? And that's how it's been for me for years. I love going into the scriptures because I know something new is going to happen and I'm going to put it in my notes. But people that don't want to study the word, they're just not going to get anything out of it or don't want to get anything out of it because it'll change things, they think. Well, yeah, but for the better. People don't seem to realize that walking with Christ is a lot more rewarding than walking with the world and Satan. She says, those who believe that God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven their sins should not, through temptation, fail to press on to fight the good fight of faith. You know, because uh, obedience is better than sacrifice. It's all, King Saul found that out the hard way. And then fin she finishes by saying, their faith should grow stronger until their Christian life, as well as their words, shall declare the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth me from all sin. That's why he wrote 1 John 1, 9. You know, my blood was spilt, he's saying. He said, it is finished on the cross. If you believe what he did on that cross, your sins are gone, as long as you confess them. You cannot die with an unconfessed sin, because then you have to die for that sin. But if you confess it, then Christ died for it. So, getting back to what the Lord's about to have me do here. What was refused by the Seventh-day Adventist leaders back in 1888 is about to bless each and every obedient Christian in the obedient Seventh-day Remnant movement, including myself, from this day forward. We are so close to the return of Christ now that studying such things as this is extremely important. And as you're about to learn, this was prophesied. You know, as many of you may be aware, two men in the uh, early SDA movement, you know, when the uh, pioneers were obedient in the ninth hour, and um, but not all of them. It was getting to the point now where things were changing. This is 1888. Two men were called up and, and to step up and to declare a message from the Holy Spirit himself at a general conference meeting back in 1888. And this also was the spinoff onto making it look like the Holy Spirit doesn't exist. This rejection of this truth allowed for a plethora of all sorts of false dogma. And I call it dogma because it has nothing to do with scripture and everything to do with paganism. These two men presented the truth as it was given them from God, but the leaders in the church rejected it. And then check this out. Sister White stated the following regarding their, this deadly decision of the Seventh-day Adventist leaders back then. She said this, Selected Messages, uh, pages 234 and 235. And Sister White said this in rebuke to these men that rejected the message of these two brothers in the faith, E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones. She says, An unwillingness to yield a preconceived opinions and to accept this truth lay at the foundation of a large share of the opposition manifested at Minneapolis against the Lord's message through brethren E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones. By exciting that opposition, Satan succeeded in shutting away from our people, in a great measure, the special power of the Holy Spirit that God longed to impart to them. The enemy prevented them from obtaining that efficiency, which might have been theirs, in carrying the truth to the world. Now check this out. She said that as the apostles proclaimed it after the day of Pentecost, what they did at Pentecost was the former reign. What these men did in 1888 rejected the latter reign. She finishes this statement by saying that the light that was to lighten the whole earth with its glory was resisted, and by the action of our own brethren has been in great decree 
kept away from the world. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew 9, verses 37 and 8? He said, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye, therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. The Lord has always sent his people forward. And yes, we have seen him do this many times over the years in our little movement, if you will, our church family. And it's about to get even better. It's about to go off the chart, brothers and sisters. A lot of prayers have been answered in the last few weeks. A lot of things have been opened up to us in the last few weeks that we're all going to be seeing like we've never seen before. Now notice this, though. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's written towards ministers, what I'm about to read. But all of it, all of us, in fact, have a, have a calling now as the great commission of our Lord, King, Savior, Jesus Christ, has promised upon all of us. We have a great commission to go forward. And this is what we shall do. Now, this is from, let's see if I can fit this in the room. Probably not. So I'm going to put it in one paragraph at a time. This first one is from Testimonies to Ministers, Volume 5. And again, this is specifically written for ministers. But are we not all called to go forth now in these last days? <laughs> this is what amazes these, these false prophets and these apostate leaders when someone that has never even gone to cemetery. Yeah, I know. It's, they call it seminary. I call it cemetery. They, we, we haven't gone to any of that fall to all. We haven't been taught all that confusion. And yet, we declare the word in a way that they can't even contemplate. Check it out. It says this. Oops, I forgot to hit enter on the... There it goes. Paragraph 1, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 299. Oh, I'm sorry, paragraph (laughs) 2. Starts with paragraph 2. It says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah. He did not seek to be the Lord's messenger, but the word came to him. You know, there's people out there that uh, demand you call them pastor and and claim they're ordained and they never were. And there's people that don't really want to do that kind of work, but the Lord just places it upon them because he looks at the heart. She says, God always has men to whom he entrusts his message. His spirit moves upon their hearts and constrains them to speak. Remember Jeremiah? It's like a fire that burns within. He cannot stay. Amen to that. She says, stimulated by holy zeal and with divine impulse strong upon them, they enter upon the performance of their duty without coldly calculating the consequences of speaking to the people the word which the Lord has given them. But the servant of God is soon made aware that he has risked something. He finds himself and his message made the subject of criticism. His manners, his life, his property are all inspected and commented upon. How many times have I told some of you brothers in the faith and you sisters that have decided to step up and do something a little extra for the Lord or even go into the ministry? People are going to be watching you like a hawk now. They're going to look for everything they can find to slander you now. They've been doing that to some of us for decades, but yet we're still doing the work. Sand ballot. Who are you that we should come down and even consider what you're saying? Nehemiah knew how to respond to stuff like that, and as do we. She goes on. His message, you know, the minister or whoever's called to go forth, his message is picked to pieces and rejected in the most illiberal and unsanctified spirit as men in their finite judgment see fit because they can't see past their own noses, right? So they can't even see the forest for the trees. They just see a chunk of bark. And so has, she says, has that message done the work that God designed it should accomplish? No. It has signally failed because the hearts of the hearers were unsanctified. Now check out the next paragraph here. Paragraph 3, Testimony Submitted Stewards, Volume 5. 
page 299, paragraph 3. It says, if the minister's face is not flint, and flint is so hard, my brothers and sisters, that if you hit it, it's going to spark. That's what they put in lighters to this day. Okay? So, if the minister's face is not flint, if he has not indomitable faith and courage, if his heart is not made strong by constant communion with God, he will begin to shape his testimony to please the unsanctified ears and hearts of those he is addressing. Why? Well, because as his 501c3 dictates, he's in it for the money. He wants what's in your pocket. Period. That's not only Seventh-day Adventism, that's Protestantism, that's Catholicism, that's Hinduism, that's Islam. It's all of it. They're all doing it. So she says, in endeavoring to avoid the criticism to which he is exposed, she says he separates from God and loses the sense of divine favor and his testimony becomes tame and lifeless. And that's what happened to all these preachers of filthy lucre out there. That's all they do. The minute they're... Uh, paycheck is in jeopardy, they clam up. She finishes by saying that, you know, this is the pastor that falls off the path. She says, he finds that his courage and his faith are gone and his labor powerless. The world is full of flatterers and dissemblers who have yielded to the desire to please. You know, keep that guy in the pew. He's got a lot of money. And if I preach this sermon, he's going to leave this church and I'm going to lose that money. And so they're going to please the guy with the big bucks or the girl with the big bucks. It don't matter. So the world is full of flatterers and dissemblers who have yielded to the desire to please. But the faithful men who do not study self-interest but love their brethren too well to suffer sin upon them are few indeed. And that's why the laborers are few. As prophesied. We, the remnant people, have the same message of John the Baptist, which is referred to as the Elijah message, as most of us know. Or, or somebody people, some people call it, you know, going forth in the spirit of Elijah. Same thing. So, just as John warned the people to be ready for the coming of the Lord as he baptized them, so will we go forth to prepare the, the people for the coming of the Lord. And the amazing thing here is, due to the prophesied apostate Seventh-day Adventist leaders doing as prophecy said, the ninth hour church would do in Revelation twelve seventeen, as well as Matthew 20, verses 1 to 7. We, the children of the obedient pioneers, the obedient ones, have turned our hearts to their message, exactly as prophecy said we would. What, what I mean is, notice this prophetic statement of the prophet Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 says this, and that's actually kind of repeated in Luke chapter 1. I'll get to that in a moment. Luke chapter 1, verse 17, you know. But Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers. Lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And by the way, the Jews took that last verse out because it had the word curse in it. And they didn't want their Bible to end with a curse. And so they took that out. Luke 1, 17 says, And he shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elias, or Elijah, you know, because Elias means Elijah in the New Testament, uh, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, please listen closely. After the great disappointment of 1844, as well as the rejection of the message of the Holy Spirit in 1888, the pioneers or the fathers as they are called in the prophecy here. The fathers did the studies and compiled the truth as it was given them to study as well as in vision from Sister White so that we, the children of the fathers, later on, could pick up the task to go forth to present it. And yes, this is why the workers got angry in Matthew chapter 20 when they saw the 11th hour workers getting the exact same pay they did even though they did most of the work all day long. That's exactly what we see happen in historic record. The corrupt Seventh-day Adventist leaders continue to soil the work as well as claim the work of the pioneers that were obedient as if it's their own work, which it's not. That's why they keep having the Revelation seminars and repeating things over and over and over again just to fill the pews because people are leaving in droves. 
But these men in the Seventh-day Adventist Church are not blessed of God to partake in the latter rain any more than those that rejected the message in 1888. And by the way, as we know, the apostate SDA leaders changed the spirit of prophecy writings and even moved most in their churches to start using the NIV Bibles to keep the final warning hidden, as well as their corrupted leadership intact, of course. But Sister White not only knew what they were up to all along, she prophesied her original books would not only be altered, but they would resurface just in time. That's why we've been doing what we have been doing the last, what, 10, 15 years here in Seventh-day Remnant Movement? Getting those original books back out there? You want to see it prophesied? Check it out. This is the first one. It says, and this is Sister White talking about them changing her books. She said, our religion would be changed the fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as error. A new organization would be established. Books of a new order would be written. Notice she didn't say printed. She said written. They took away and added to her books. So they wrote things. They didn't just print her books. They changed them. And this next one here is from Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 11. It says, The testimony of Jesus said to the angel, to John, is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19, verse 10. It is the keeping of the commandments of God and the recognition of the revival of the spirit of prophecy by the remnant of the church. There's a reason I give emphasis there, and I'll explain here. And she's giving emphasis here as well. So she says, by the remnant of the church. But now all of a sudden, the seven-day Adventists will say, oh, once he says church, she's not talking about the SDA. Because whenever she says church, they always say that she's talking about the SDA church when she's not. She's talking about the obedient people sometimes when she just uses the word church. And because they got most of their people to believe that, they have got them thinking the edited books are fine and dandy. And so... The revival of the spirit of prophecy, well, let me backtrack. The test, well, I'm not going to read all that. Uh, she says, it is the keeping of the commandments of God and the recognition of the revival of the spirit of prophecy by the remnant of the church or the Christians of the last generation that stirs the ire of the dragon. That's Revelation 12, 17, brothers and sisters. But why did she place emphasis on the remnant of the church? Well, notice the prophecy of Revelation 12, 17. It specifically speaks of our day when it is said that the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. I mean, common sense dictates that the dragon is only angry with the woman in Revelation 12, 17 because of the problems she caused in the ninth hour when the fathers of the children were obedient. You know, the pioneers like James White and Sister White and all them. Okay, she's not a father, but you know what I mean. And so, but common sense dictates that the dragon's only angry with the woman because of the issues he had with her in the ninth hour. But the prophecy is crystal clear here that he's making war with the remnant of her seed. He's not making war with the seven-day Adventist church. He's making war with those that left it. Why? Because we're picking up the work. We're the children that the father set up all the work for. So he's making war with us. And so to confuse the people further, the Seventh-day Adventist church keeps going out there and telling everybody they're the remnant church. When just one Bible verse shows them as bold-faced liars. How can you be the woman in Revelation 12, 17, as well as your own remnant at the same time? You can't be the woman and the remnant at the same time. It's impossible, physically and spiritually, as well as prophetically, or even historically. Now, if you hear anything in this study... Hear this prophetic statement made by John in Revelation. It's going to be uh, Revelation 14, verses 12 to 15. Okay, Revelation 14, verses 12 to 15 is where I'm going to um, be starting here. And so again, if you hear anything, please hear this prophetic statement made by John. And then also notice the timing of this prophecy and how it's going down and how he's making the statement. He says, starting at verse 12, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. By the way, angels one 
Angels 2 and Angels 3 were just shared. If you read verses 6 to 11 in Revelation 14. And now this is being presented when it says that, in other words, these are the ones that don't get the mark of the beast and why. And now check out what happens next. Verses 13 on says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. I'll get back to that word in a minute. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. You know, the fathers. And their works do follow them. So the first, second, and third angel's message is presented, and the fathers go to their graves. And their works do follow them, just like the prophet Malachi said. And then verse 14 says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud. Again, this is after the Father's work was done, and they died, and the return of Christ is obviously next. But before, you know, and that, that carries quite a few years in there, obviously, because we're going forth in between that time after the fathers died, and then the children pick up the work, because our hearts are turned to the fathers, and their hearts are turned to us. In other words, they did the work knowing that they are not going to be alive at the second coming. And so they figured, let's do it for the kids, our children in the future. I mean, they didn't know it would be great, 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 great grandchildren, but it doesn't matter. We're still their children. And so, and upon the cloud sat like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. The harvest. Verse 15, And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap. For the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of earth is ripe. So this is, of course, speaking of the patriarchs and prophets of old and how their works followed them via the 66 books of the Bible, as well as the obedient ninth hour Seventh-day Adventist pioneers who are asleep in their graves right now, wherein their works do follow them, and how we in the eleventh hour are blessed with the testimonies you know, so as to gain more light regarding present truth due to their studies following them after, even after they died. It's kind of like, if you look at it, this is the way I've always looked at it. You've got the Old Testament, what they call the Old Testament. Well, it's actually just the First Testament, right? The First Covenant, or the Old Covenant. You can put it that way, in fact. And so Jesus arrives, and the apostles start preaching, as, as does Paul. And they're using only the Old Testament to preach. But while doing so, they're explaining it better making it a little, giving a little more light to that which was already penned, right? And then Ellen White shows up and gives even more light to all 66 of those books. And so we're back into the scriptures. And it's kind of like the best Bible helps that ever existed, and that's why they altered her writings. And that's why we got the original books. And rightly so, because we don't have a pope, prelate, or president above us. We have Christ. We let him guide us. And it works so oh, oh, much better that way. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the Elijah message of John the Baptist that the obedient people of God in the last days are going to repeat, which, as also prophesied, is for the children to take of the fathers who studied it up for them long ago, as Malachi said. In other words, you know, just as John the Baptist echoed that which the patriarchs and prophets of old put in the word of God so as to ready the souls for Christ's first arrival 2,000 years ago, the 11th hour obedient saints of today in the final movement must go forth echoing what the 9th hour pioneers already studied up and placed in the spirit of prophecy books that reveal more light from the scripture. And so again, Luke 1.17 he shall go before them in the light of the spirit of power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. The work of the ninth hour pioneers or the fathers, what, what they did can now be used by us, the children. So has to go forth. And again, this is why they changed the spirit of prophecy and put the NIV in the seventh day Adventist church to confuse the people. But you cannot deceive the elect. They failed. Now, 
getting back to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, rejecting the message of Christ and his righteousness in 1888, Sister White stated the following from Australia, wherein the American General Conference had no power to delete. Remember when they wanted to shut her up and get her out of the picture? They sent her off to Australia, right? Problem is, they couldn't delete statements she made from there. Check it out. She said, I'm going to put this in the room, as a matter of fact. She said this from the General Conference Bulletin, May 9th, 1892. Okay, they were already well into destroying everything they could destroy because of what happened in 1888. But check it out. She said this. She said, I, I, I also saw that if you had accepted their message, you know, speaking of A.T. Uh, Jones and Wagner, I also saw that if you had accepted their message, now, I hope you're sitting down when I read this next part. She says, we would have been in the kingdom in two years from that date, which was 1888. But now we have to go back into the wilderness. And that's why, brothers and sisters, that's why the prophecy of Malachi is being fulfilled right before our eyes. We, the children, are turning our hearts towards the work of the fathers. And since they rejected that sermon series back then, this means it was literally, that sermon was written for us. Praise his mighty name. Because as we also know, Malachi prophesied about all this before the sermon was even penned. A.T. Jones and Wagoner were just, they weren't even born yet. So therefore, with all that being said, I believe if we go over the sermon series in these last days, and I hope and pray that everybody's in attendance when we do this, it's going to take a few months, maybe. I don't know how long it's going to take, because I'm going to read it word for word, as to how it was penned. And whenever the Lord gives inspiration, I'm going to be putting in the scriptures an additional spirit of prophecy so as to have the additional light that they already planned for us to have for these days. The truth contained in this sermon series is going to bring many of God's people back on the well-lit path of our Heavenly Father's perfect will so as to be ready to be used of the Lord in the loud cry when he blesses us with the latter rain. And so as we go through this series that was rejected by the apostate Seventh-day Adventist leaders back in 1880 and is still rejected now, I pray that the Holy Spirit blesses us with additional light for our day, as I am sure additional scripture as well as spirit of prophecy will be united into this blessed sermon series due to the fact that not only do we need much more light so as to better see the path in these very dark days, many prophetic events that were not fulfilled in the days this sermon series was originally presented have been fulfilled in our day. This will not only lend additional credence to the message presented by E.J. Wagoner, because I'm going to kind of focus on his sermon, Christ and his righteousness, because if we understand who Christ Jesus is in the coming months, he's going to easily use this when the latter rain falls. If we have a better understanding of who Jesus Christ is and what he's done for us and how to present that information to others, not only is it going to lend credence to the message that was originally presented in 1888, it will also allow us to see how the Holy Spirit was involved in this message back then. And as promised, will be involved in our days so that when the time is perfect, the promised latter rain will be upon us to not only present, to better present the final message unto all, we will have a much clearer vision onto the long prophesied task at hand. And yes, some of this sermon series may be a little bit too hard to understand, you know, for some, as this message was originally planned as a presentation of the ordained leaders of the General Conference SDA Church, right? And so that being the case, I'm going to do my best to explain the more difficult areas which Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy testimonies as needed to put a bigger light on all of it to make even the babe in Christ understand. And so, yeah, I'm going to be praying a lot on this one as I know my brothers and sisters will be as well. And so I do believe those of us that want a much closer walk with Christ are going to find this study hour for the next few months a powerful means by which to see Christ and his righteousness glorified. I mean, the fact it was prophesied, we the children would turn our hearts towards the work of the fathers, show that we will have all we need from Scripture and Spirit of Prophecy so as to not only find a closer walk in Jesus, we will have a much clearer view of what his will is for each and every one of us. And so it's no mistake you're here today. And it's no mistake this message was rejected so as to become a blessing unto all of us in the coming days.
I really hope and pray you were blessed by what was shared this Sabbath day.